Welcome to Downtown Sports. My name is Downtown Stephen Brown, and in today's video, guys, I want to talk about the news about the Maple Leafs apparently being close to trading away Nick Ritchie, what they can do with the cap space afterwards, and how much it would cost to get another team to take him on. I also want to talk about Justin Hall, highlight some individual performances, and talk about the last couple of games as well. Like I had said off the top, it was rumored during the second intermission of the Leafs Canucks game during the 32 Thoughts segment that the Leafs are apparently getting close to dealing away Nick Ritchie. And what that would mean for them in this year's trade deadline is more cap space, but a much more cap space. Well, if we go over to Cap Friendly and we plug it into the trade machine here, it says that the Maple Leafs would have $705,000 in effective cap space if they were to deal away Nick Ritchie today. Now, this $705,000 is not the face amount of cap space that the Maple Leafs could add to this roster. It's the prorated amount of cap space that they can add to this roster because you have to remember that contracts during the year are prorated, and especially at the trade deadline, it's about 80% into the season. So whenever you acquire a player, you're acquiring them at 20% of their current cap hit. So if you have someone that has a $5 million face cap hit value at the trade deadline, you only need a million dollars in effective space to acquire that player. Someone with a $10 million cap hit, you only need $2 million in effective cap space to acquire the player. So I believe that $705,000 at the trade deadline would allow the Maple Leafs to acquire a player making about $3.5 million against the salary cap. And if you were able to get 50% salary retained in this deal, then the Maple Leafs would be able to acquire a player that's making about $7 million against the cap. And if you get double salary retained, like they did with Nick Foligno last year, like the Lightning did with David Savard, well, then you can just double the number again. But the thing to make note of is that this $705,000 is... Not three and a half million dollars today. It is three and a half million dollars at the trade deadline. If the Maple Leafs were looking to go out and acquire someone today, this $705,000 in effective cap space wouldn't go as far because the player's salaries are not prorated as much. But it works both ways. The longer that the Maple Leafs wait to trade Nick Ritchie, hypothetically, let's say that they do that at the trade deadline, the less cap space that the eventual deal is going to net them. So then the focus shifts to how much it's going to cost for the Maple Leafs to get another team to take on Nick Ritchie's contract, which has another year remaining where the total amount of salary that's owed to him actually increases. But if I had to guess what it would cost to get another team to take on Nick Ritchie's contract, I'm not paying based on the two and a half million dollar cap hit, and I'm not paying based on the $3.3 million in salary. I'm paying based on what it would cost to buy him out which would be 300 grand against the cap next year, $1.1 million the season after that, and $2.2 million in actual money in total. If the team that acquires Nick Ritchie chooses to keep him under contract and play him on their roster next year, obviously they feel that he has some sort of value. And if they feel that way, then they can take on the full contract. But if they don't feel that way, then this is all they're on the hook for. And at that point, what are you really paying for another team to take on $2.2 million in salary, 300 grand against the cap in the first season, and $1.1 million against the cap in the second season? I mean, if the Maple Leafs wanted to pay even less, they could hypothetically retain on Nick Ritchie's deal and share in this buyout. Now, that would mean that they would have less money to work with at this year's deadline, but it definitely wouldn't cost a second and definitely not even a third to get this deal done you're probably looking at like a fourth or a fifth round pick. All of that to say that it really shouldn't cost very much for the Maple Leafs to do this. And if they are able to do it, they should probably do it sooner rather than later. And if they're able to do it within the next week or two, they'll probably have access to all the cab space that they would need at this year's trade deadline. All of that context to say that it probably shouldn't cost the Maple Leafs very much to trade away a guy like Nick Ritchie, but that they should do it sooner rather than later for reasons that we explained. But if they are able to, they'll more than likely have all of the cab space that they'll need to do whatever they want at this year's trade deadline. And that's without taking anyone off of their current roster. That's not relying on injuries or LTIR. That's not relying on an egregious amount of salary retention either, but that still is an option if they really, really want to upgrade this roster. In regards to the game last night against the Seattle Kraken, 
Um, if you're looking at the advanced stats, this actually looks like the Kraken outplayed the Leafs because they led the game in terms of the shot attempts, the actual shots, the scoring opportunities, and the expected goals. But if you watch the game, yeah, the Leafs could have played a little bit better defensively. A couple of players uh, could have not made a couple of bonehead moves. But this was very much a game where the Maple Leafs were uh, <laughs> a lot more talented and they recognized it. And offensively, they didn't really have to try very hard and they still won 6-2. to two. Well, that's not necessarily something to be proud of, I mean, I respect that the Maple Leafs are able to do that because it is an 82-game season and you can't give 100% every single night, right? They got two days off between now and when they'll play the Pittsburgh Penguins at home, and that's going to start a stretch where they're going to be playing eight games in the next 13 days. There's a back-to-back -back, uh, with the Capitals and the Sabres here that bleeds into the beginning of March. But I mean, there were positives to take away from this game. John Tavares goes into the corner, he lays a hit, he gets the puck back, and is able to feed Kerfoot in the high slot, and he snipes one on Philip Grubauer. William Nylander had a couple of assists in this game as well, and hopefully that goes straight to their legs, and maybe they play a little bit more confident in the upcoming stretch of games, because that whole second line really hasn't been good the last while. The one goal that Michael Bunting scored, the four checkers who were in deep doing work along the boards were... Actually, Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews, and they were able to win that puck battle, and it squirted back out in front, and he was able to bury his rookie-leading 15th goal of the season. Timothy Lilligren has five points in his last six games as he added two assists in this one, and I mean, while we said that the Leafs weren't very good defensively in this one, and it could have been a lot worse if the Kraken were a more talented team offensively, Jack Campbell made the saves that he should have. So hopefully that helps him get back into a groove, because... They're going to need him and Peter Morazic to be solid the next little while. Justin Hall had another game where he was sort of slipping and sliding all over the place, but I don't know how much I want to really zero in on that specifically because it looked like a lot of guys were last night. I don't know if the ice was just bad in Seattle, but over his last three games played, he's been on the ice for five goals against that five on five. And some of that is related to goaltending. The least goalies haven't been the greatest the last little while, but most of that is just directly related to I don't even know what to call them. Massive, massive mistakes where he implodes on himself. The Maple Leafs have controlled the majority of the shot attempts, the actual shots, the expected goals, and the scoring opportunities by a fair margin when Hall's been on the ice the last couple of games. But the underlying numbers are nothing to hide behind. You know, usually when a goal goes in, you can say, oh, it was this guy's fault a little bit, that guy's fault a little bit. Maybe the goalie could have had it. But it's really, really bad when you can assign the majority of the blame and everyone can collectively agree that this one guy messed it up. Here's where I'm at with Justin Hall. While I don't think that three games should be damning, I do think that we can draw conclusions from them. I am done playing him in the Maple Leafs top four or next to Jake Muzzin altogether. But to the people who just completely want him off the team, you're wrong and you need to relax. First off, I'm not a fan of Justin Hall. I don't necessarily like advocating for him. But at the same time, it wouldn't be fair of me to not point out that in the recent stretch of games before the previous three, he was third in Maple Leafs defenseman in terms of time on ice per game, had good underlying numbers, and they controlled the majority of the actual goals 11-4, to with him playing a pretty prominent role with Jake Muzzin out of the lineup. I am done with him playing next to Jake Muzzin in the top four, because faking it until you make it is not an option. And I would so much rather see Timothy Lilligren playing with Jake Muzzin because then at least something positive can come out of it. We already know what this guy is and it's not a top four defenseman. So stop playing him there. And if you want to say that the Maple Leafs should use that spot on the third pair to acquire an inserted defenseman who can be effective while also adding some toughness and some grit into the lineup, I'm all for that, right? If you want to acquire two guys, one to play in your top four and another to add some size and some toughness there, um, that's fine. But I'm still not trading Justin Hall. Like everyone likes to say, you're going to need eight, nine, maybe even 10 defensemen to go through the playoffs. Um, and he can still be a good player on this team. Just not in their top four. And then if you want to talk about that game against the Canucks, I mean, wow, Thatcher Demko was amazing in that game. I saw some people saying after this game that they didn't get goalied, that they just don't have enough finishing talent or they don't have the shooters in order to capitalize on the high volume of scoring opportunities that they get. And this is just not true. 
The Maple Leafs, since the beginning of the new year, rank ninth in the NHL in terms of shooting percentage on scoring chances. 16th in terms of high danger shooting percentage, but again, it's not the largest of samples, and also that's not anything egregiously low to say, hey, yeah, they need more finishing talent. And then 8th overall in terms of just regular shooting percentage. And this includes games where they scored 4 goals on 36 shots against Frederick Anderson, 4 goals on 22 shots on Robin Lehner, and 3 goals on 47 shots against John Gibson. Kevin McGran, a longtime reporter with the Toronto Star, tweeted this out the other day. This is the Maple Leafs' 8th straight day on the ice, either practicing or playing. Tomorrow's game will make it 9. Can't remember the last time that happened. Maybe under Pat Quinn? And if we're remembering that TikTok that I showed from Sean McKenzie in the middle of January when Toronto got all of that snow, the Leafs had just come home from a West Coast road trip where they played each game in a different time zone. It was the road trip where they blew all of those multi-goal leads, but they didn't have a day off. They didn't have a snow day. They got bag skated. Whatever you think that they need to improve on, they've probably been working on it. And whatever areas they can't improve on just with practice, they'll more than likely look to upgrade at the trade deadline. That's what that's for. I know I didn't touch on Jake Muzzin leaving the game against Seattle. He went in for a big hit along the boards and kind of fell really hard on what looked like his arm or his wrist. He did come back. He did finish the game. Um, in the long run, I am concerned about his durability and what they're going to have in him come playoff time because he hasn't been able to stay healthy in the playoffs. And eventually, what you can do for me in the regular season turns into that's nice, but what about the playoffs? And if you can't count on him to be healthy or in the lineup come playoff time, it's just an unfortunate circumstance, but it's just business. I don't really know what the Maple Leafs can do about it now, but it's a conversation for another day because I don't want to hyper-focus in on just a couple of games now that he's back in the lineup. So we'll have a more well-rounded conversation on him maybe towards the end of next week. But that's going to be it for this video, guys. Make sure to like the video if you did like it and subscribe for more because more is always on the way. And guys, I'll see you in the next one.